Hi, everyone. Welcome. Bienvenue. Thank you for coming to the 82nd event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Technology Speaker and Workshop Series. This event is co-sponsored and organized by the Indigenous Futures Research Center of Concordia University. In a moment, Vanessa will speak more about the IFRC. So, Vanessa, do you want to speak? <laughs> Hi, everyone. So I'm Vanessa Racine. I'm Anishinaabe and also a member of Beaver House First Nation. I'm also a master's student here in the Individualized Program at Concordia, uh, with my focus on the intersection of Anishinaabe video game development and linguistics. Uh, so I'm currently working at Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace, uh, which is an Indigenous new media lab run by Jason Lewis and Skawanadi. Uh, it's also a unit that's hosted under the IFRC, which is our uh, co-host. So the Indigenous Futures Research Center, also known as the IFRC, uh, supports research that is led uh, by Indigenous peoples and communities. So supporting a mix of research approaches, topics, and collaborations ranging across art and technology, making scholarly analysis, community collaboration, experimental pedagogy, and theoretical analysis uh, and development. The IFRC aims to illuminate how the challenges of the present can be addressed in part through concrete, constructive, and critical dreams of the future. Thanks, Vanessa. So I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum, and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies at McGill and the organizer of the Disrupting Disruption series, um, which has a very long name. And it seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. And I'm so excited to welcome you all. I'm just going to do a little bit of an announcement of some other upcoming events. So we have three other upcoming events this semester. Tomorrow, there's a hybrid event with Dr. Avery Dame Griff, who will be speaking about his book on transgender internet histories on number on November 4th, there will be the LGBTQ plus book celebration from 6 to 8 at Le Guillon Feminist and Queer Bookstore. On November 15th, Dr. Tamara Nice will speak about her new book, Death Glitch, How Techno Solutionism Fails Us in This Life and Beyond at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. That will be a hybrid event with in-person and virtual options. You can find our full schedule as well as video recordings of our past events at disruptingdisruptions.com. So that's the redirect URL, disruptingdisruptions.com. The other URL is way too long to remember. You can also find our list of sponsors, including Shirk, Milieu, Mila, Rakef, and more. For folks who are joining us online, which is all of you today, uh, we have a Q&A option available. So throughout the event, you may type your questions into the question and answer box. There will be some time during the second part of the event for our speakers to answer them. We can't guarantee that every question will be answered, but we are grateful for the discussion that you generate. Thank you to our captioner for today, Max. As we welcome you into our homes and our offices through Zoom, and you welcome us into yours, let's be mindful of space and place. Past series speakers Suzanne Kite and Jess McLean have pointed to the physical and material impacts of the digital world. While the events this semester are mostly virtual or hybrid, everything that we do is tied to the land and the space that we are on. The virtual is tied to the earth. Furthermore, as the series seeks to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it is important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices. Two of the hosting universities for today's event are located in Jojoge, Montreal, on unceded Ganyangahaga territory and the meeting place of many Indigenous communities. Furthermore, the ongoing organizing efforts across this continent, such as the organizing by the West Wollon people at the Unistone camp, make clear the ever-present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with this history of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. For example, the series is affiliated with the IGSF of McGill University, the university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved Black and Indigenous peoples. It was in part from the money he acquired through these violent acts that McGill University was founded. These histories are here with us in this space and inform the conversations we have today. I encourage you to learn more about the lands that you are on. NativeLand.ca is a fantastic resource for doing so. So thank you all for coming and joining us tonight. Vanessa will now introduce our speakers. Yeah, so uh, today we're joined by um, we're joined by sisters and co-founders of Revital Software, Gehendawaks, and 
when I get on to shot. So um, Gehenda Wax is a multidisciplinary artist with a particular focus on video games. She grew up in Ghana Satage, where she was immersed in learning the Mohawk language, culture, and traditions. These experiences inform much of her artistic practice today, which includes 3D modeling, illustration, game making, and sculpture. Formerly the Skins Workshop Associate Director for Abtech and the Indigenous in the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. She's now the founder and artistic director of Revital Software, a company specializing in indigenous language and learning video games. And then we also have her sister joining with us, uh, Wene Garago. Uh, Wene Garago is Mohawk from Ganesatage as well with a background in early childhood education. Uh, after graduating from Concordia University with a bachelor's in child studies, she worked for a private daycare in Montreal, where she discovered her passion for creating and learning activities for her kids through arts and crafts. Today, she's a digital artist whose works have been exhibited and commissioned by community organizations in Ganawage. At Revital Software, she's a game asset artist committed to creating content for children to reconnect with their language in a fun and interactive way. Um, so Revital Software is a small company that works with indigenous communities to create interactive language revitalization software. And the other pair of sisters that are joining us today is from Studio Ecosi. So we have Kaylee Lightning and Kira Lightning. Uh, so Kira is Cree from Samson Cree Nation, where she's the lead writer and game designer for Studio Ecosi. Kira is currently completing her Master's of Native Studies at the University of Alberta, where she's writing and teaching about Indigenous-led science and ecology. We also have Kaylee, who's a Cree and Irish Two-Spirit artist and a member of Samson Cree Nation as well. She's also completing her Master's at Design at Concordia University, and she's a research assistant at the um, Aptec and Initiative for Indigenous Futures, and she's the lead artist uh, and illustrator at Studio Ecosi. Much of her work comes from her experiences as a queer, displaced Naya, exploring themes of sexuality, love, and interconnectedness. Uh, so Studio Cozy uses narrative-driven games and animated films to create moments of joy, worlds that spark wonder, and characters people see themselves in. And... Awesome. So uh, to our yeah. first set of speakers. Awesome. So I'll just lead a bit uh talk a little bit about the roadmap for this event so i'm gonna have both the sisters kind of introduce themselves and their work in a bit more detail um and kind of give them some time to explain what they're up to uh kind of yeah the history what they're up to um and how they kind of came about to create what they're doing right now uh so i'll have uh the tisha sisters go first and then kaylee and kira lightning after uh, and then after that, we'll get into a bit of a discussion, um, some questions and answers. And then following that, we'll look at the audience questions and answers if there's any. So we'll start off with Revital Software. Um, I'll let you guys set up it for a hot minute. Alrighty, I'll just start sharing my slides. Okie dokie. Hopefully you're seeing my slides. Yes, yeah. Not quite yet, but it looks like Not it's lightning. Yet. All right. Now we can. Thank you. All right. Excellent. So, hello, everybody. I'm the Hondawux of the Tuisha Sisters. And yeah, I'll be kicking off our portion of the presentation. So, um, yeah, my sister and I grew up in Gunnisadaga. We're both Bear Clan and digital artists and today we make language learning video games. So first I'll start off by talking a little bit about my personal work and how it led into creating these video games. So for me personally, um, everything started kind of in 2019 when I created my very first video game called Garihunyon Mitsara. And it was a Mohawk language visual novel um, that I created as part of like an independent study when I was still completing my degree at Concordia. And it was actually exhibited at the uh, 2019 Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival, which was really exciting for me at the time because this was the first video game I had ever made. So I thought, oh my God, wow, it's so incredible and exciting that like this first thing that I've made has been accepted into this festival. And that really like bolstered my confidence to think, huh, 
maybe this is something I can do as like my career. Like maybe people would be interested in this other than just me and my friends and family. <laughs> so yeah, um, the game was playable in both Mohawk and English. You could kind of toggle between the two if there was something you didn't understand in the Mohawk language. And the intent with creating it was for it to be like a language learning tool, which was kind of where I started to think, you know, to make the grand design for Revital software, however many years down the road. So the story of Garihunya Nitsura is basically a young girl is asking her grandmother why it's important that we take care of Mother Earth. And yeah, so her grandmother or her Duda, as she's called in the game, um, like takes her on this journey through her home community and is like identifying the local flora and fauna uh, and basically explaining the little parts that each portion of nature plays and kind of how it all works together. Um, yeah, so fun fact about this game, it was the first time that uh, myself and Fred, who is our programmer at the company today, ever worked together. So yeah, this was our first project before becoming Revital Software. So this next one is called Negiro Dianau, which translates to this is their legacy. Um, it was a VR experience that kind of followed the story of a young indigenous girl uh, going through the foster care system. And it was a piece about how the foster care system is kind of carrying on the legacy of residential schools because indigenous children are overrepresented in the foster care system and often end up with non-indigenous families. So they lose the touch with their culture, with their people, with their language and all of those same things that were perpetuated and, you know, encouraged by residential schools. Hold on, George. Uh, I'm not seeing the slide that you're on. I think it's still in the first one. Oh yeah, okay, let's see. For it everyone that's, ah. There you go. All right, cool. So this was Garihunya Nitsara, if you couldn't see it. And this is Negi Rotiyana, which is what I'm talking about now. Sorry about that. If the slides don't work again, can like somebody let me know? <laughs> so I don't just keep going. <laughs> All right, um, so for Negiro Dianau, um, this was the first game where the current team, uh, the development team at Revital Software all worked together as a group. So I did the 3D modeling and the texturing for this game. And then Frederick, who's our programmer to this day, did all of the Unity and engine stuff. And Wana Geralgo actually did the voice acting for this. So this was our first like dip into working together as a team. Um, this is like a very long standing project of mine that I think I started maybe in 2019 and I'm still working on today, but one day it will be done. <laughs> um, it's called Black Fawn. It's a visual novel that talks about uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and two spirit people. Um, yeah, I came up with the idea for this game while actually teaching a skins workshop called seventh generation character design and I just ran with it from there. So hopefully somewhere in the next few years, it'll be complete. Um, but the first chapter was exhibited at the 2023 Bad Game Arcade that was hosted at uh, Concordia's Fourth Space. Um, oh yeah, the slides again, okay. Yeah, I think it's giving you trouble. It is a little bit. All right, here we go. So this is what Black Fawn looked like. So yeah, all of these different sketches are me trying to figure out uh, what my main character was gonna look like because I'm very indecisive. So yeah, I think I've settled finally on the one all the way on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it for my work for now. So I'll hand it over to Wana Geragun so she can tell you a little bit about her work. Hello. <laughs> you can go right to the next slide. All right, that's good. Okay, so hi, my name is Wanagerda Gutuisha. I'm a digital artist with a background in child studies from Concordia University. Um, I started this journey in 2020 when like many others, I quit my job because of the pandemic and I taught myself how to draw. In 2021, I joined Revital with my sister and what you're seeing right now are some recent works that have been exhibited by the Gunawage Language and Cultural Center. I work on commissions for books, games, and I also design t-shirts that bring stories from our communities to life. Right now, my goal as an artist is to update the material that we use today. Next slide. If you went to a reservation school, you're probably familiar with some of these images. In all of our language and cultural centers, we have books that were made before the internet. 
So right now you're seeing the flying head, the gifts of the little people and how the, sorry, how the bear clan became medicine keepers. As a kid, I thought these stories were kind of old and a little boring and had nothing to do with how we live and view the world today because the characters didn't dress like me or live in our world. As an adult, I now see the value of these stories and how the moral of these stories still rings true today, which is what we wanna show in our games. Next slide. This is how these same stories look in our storyboards, characters with modern non-traditional clothes with the stories to be set in present day to be more relatable, but still with the intention of learning language through story. My goal is for kids to see these stories and identify with them while also learning how to speak our language in ways that ma match the media they consume today. There's so much material in these cultural centers that could be used as game material, and I think it's really fun and exciting to bring these materials to life and share them in a new light, in a brand new way that so many Native kids can relate to through video games. Back to you, George. <laughs> for anybody that's confused, George is my family's nickname for me. <laughs> All right, so um, why video games? Which is, you know, a question that my sister and I are asked fairly often, like of all tools to teach language, why this? And there are a few ways to answer that question. And it all kind of starts with my childhood. So there are four kids in our family. There's myself, Wanagiragum, my sister, Garakwina, and my brother, Doni Dogu. We got our first console uh, when we were kids. It was the PlayStation 2. And as soon as it came through the door, we were obsessed. And it got to the point where our parents were like, oh, if you practiced your language as often as you played video games, you'd be fluent by now. And I kind of ended up thinking to myself, like, if there were Mohawk video games, I'd be playing them, wouldn't I? But there aren't. So um, at the time, just to give you a bit of context, my siblings and I all attended a Mohawk immersion elementary school. So we were in full immersion at school. But then when we came home, our parents didn't speak. Uh, most of our relatives didn't speak. So we just ended up speaking English to each other at home while we were watching English movies, playing English video games and reading English books. So as time went on, we lost pretty much everything that we learned. And today, none of us can speak Mohawk despite having gone to this immersion school. So like, because all of our media, especially our video games were in English, over time for me, um, I kind of ended up thinking like, oh, we're never in this media I'm consuming. So there's like, no place for me off the territory or like in the modern world or even in the imagined world of like sci-fi and fantasy that's often portrayed in video games because there were no native people in there. So here are some of the games we played while we were growing up. And as you can see, the main characters are anybody but indigenous Which, the people. Slide? Oh yeah, right, the slide. Sorry about that. Oh, it's fine. Oops. Yeah, so these are the video games we played as kids. And the, the main characters are anybody but indigenous people. We'll have aliens before we have indigenous people in video games. So yeah, um, our, one of the ways we could answer why video games is for my sister and I, we wanna make the games we wish we had as kids, which are games that use our language, our culture, and talk about our lives, our histories, and possible futures. Soon. We also are interested in amplifying the work of first language speakers. So, oh my gosh, my slides. Let's see. This is a photo of Wadi Zosa, who is one of the original Mohawk teachers from my community. Um, she was teaching Mohawk when I was first learning back in that immersion school when I was a kid, and she's still going today, even though she's eligible for retirement, because the reality is that there's nobody to replace her. So we're not trying to like replace teachers by creating these games. We're just trying to amplify the work that they already do because many of the games we've made on a commission basis are based off of physical resources like the stuff in cultural centers that already exist, but to bring them to like a wider audience. And if my slides cooperate, yeah. So right now, this is the state of the Mohawk language in our home community. There's 2,600 people who live there and only 60 
first language speakers. So you can imagine the strain this would have on, for example, um, the amount of Mohawk courses that can even be offered in the first place. So there's a limited number of courses, which means a limited number of spots in those courses and not everyone has time to take a course, but everybody has a minute here and there to play a video game. And what's more is that on top of the physical obstacles of being able to take a course, um, there's the emotional and mental obstacles as well. Because while we're still dealing with the intergenerational trauma of residential schools and like being ashamed of speaking our language and all of that super awful inherited stuff that we have, the younger generation is now dealing with a new fun layer of that, of being ashamed of not speaking the language in the first place or not having time to take a course or to learn. So we have all of these barriers that are like giving us difficulty when we're trying to learn our language. So yeah, video games can reach people where they're at, which is why we're doing language learning video games. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys and not just to me. All right, so basically now I'm gonna talk about what our current project is. So um, our big plan for the future and what we're working on right now is to create a free indigenous language video game library. And ideally we're focusing on Mohawk for the right now because my sister and I are Mohawk. Um, so that's the primary language for now, but we are definitely like, we welcome the opportunity to work with other communities to create games in different languages that will live on this game library that will be on our website. So um, if you can imagine like selecting one of these games from our website, you would then be brought to like the main page for that game for, yeah. For example, Gununzi Studios, which is the legend of the flying head. And you could pick between two modes of play, which would be practice mode where you would get language learning exercises or a sto story mode, which would like tell you about whatever particular legend you've selected for that game. So the story mode would be really like a visual novel that takes you through the events of a particular legend or history or piece of fiction, depending down the line, what we work on. Um, or if you select practice mode, you'll get a selection of language learning exercises that will teach you the specific vocabulary you need to be able to read through that entire legend completely in Mohawk or Ganyakeha. So yeah, that uh, is what we're working on right now. And it's the end of my presentation. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm you. really excited to see uh, the games that are gonna come out and be able to select some and try some myself. Um, so yeah, can't wait to see that. So now we're gonna move on to Studio Ecosi with Kaylee and Kira Lightning. Um, I'll give you guys a bit of time to get your slides up. Uh, Sorry, one second. I oh, know where you. I keep accidentally closing. And while we're um, moving over to the slides, I want to let people know in the audience that you're welcome to also type questions into the Q&A box throughout. We'll answer them at the end, but just um, in case anything comes to you while you're hearing the presentations. Okay, yeah, I can see the slides. I think you're okay. good. Yeah, perfect. And uh, do let me know if our slides don't work because I'm also not sure. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Uh, okay. Hi, I'm Kira Lightning. Dante uh, I am from Samson Cree Nation. I'm located uh, in Edmonton. Uh, I'll let Kaylee introduce yourself next. 
Hi, I'm Kaylee Lightning. Um, I'm also from Sense Incarnation, um, currently based in Montreal. Um, yeah, and I'll talk a bit more about myself in the next slide. But. So we are sisters from Sense Incarnation. And uh, we created uh, Studio Exe, which is an independent game and animation studio. Uh, we create moments of joy, worlds that spark wonder, and characters that people see themselves in. Oh, I keep forgetting which camera I'm looking at, sorry. Uh, and so we create animated and interactive stories that are uh, influenced by our experiences uh, as queer Cree sisters and influenced by the popular media that we've grown up with. And we try to create stories that are in fantasy worlds that come from um, those influences. And while being like influenced by our cultural understandings, uh, we saw, like we thought about how something like Another example I always use is like Lord of the Rings or like Skyrim is clearly these fantasy worlds that are very influenced by certain cultures, like Nordic cultures. And so we were thinking about how instead of trying to um, faithfully represent uh, like specific traditional stories or something, how can we create fantasy stories that are still influenced um, by our culture? So I'll go to the next slide. No, that's not very good. Okay. okay, so like I said, I'm Kaylee. Um, I pronouns are she, they. Um, like I said, I'm in uh, Montreal right now, currently um, attempting to finish up my master's of design at Concordia. Um, the, on the left hand side of the screen is uh, my thesis project that I've been working on um, for the past two years, crazy. Um, I'm creating a kind of speculative um, dress up game um, based on the kind of nostalgic early 2000s, uh, like girls go games, um, you know, drag and drop pixel dress up games um, that personally I grew up playing. Um, but I wanted to imagine what those would look like um, when they were informed by a Cree perspective with Cree aesthetics, Cree fashion, um, and things like that. Um, so these are just some screenshots from that game that is currently in progress. Um, and yeah, I also, I do a variety of digital art. Um, so I've worked with uh, Giphy in the past to make some um, animated GIFs. So there's one right there. I also do um, pixel art. And I've also worked with um, Scholastic to create a book cover for Autumn Bird and the Runaway. Um, so yeah, I kind of do just a variety. If it's digital art, I'll probably be doing it in some way. I really like to try to, I don't know, do a variety of things. Otherwise I get bored. So yeah, next slide. I work so much with technology and yet I can't seem to figure out how to work twice. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I am a master's student at the University of Alberta, and I work with the Indigenous Science, Technology, and Society Lab at the University of Alberta. I have taught the Indigenous Peoples and Technoscience course there, uh, been a TA for a few years, some of these pictures here. So um, my research, I've been looking at environmental management it's somewhat related to our storytelling. Sorry. Sorry, I'm getting the phone call because my car is in the shop. Um, where am I? Okay. So I actually research environmental management and ecology uh, in my individual interests. And so some of these pictures here show I got my fire certification from Parks Canada and I'm going to be 
working on cultural burning and wildfire management for a PhD starting in January once I finish this master's thesis. And you can see here some of the pictures that I have from working on prescribed burns at Elk Island National Park. Uh, this one down in the corner here is from a, a talk that I did about prescribed burning at uh, Elk Island National Park and talking about what the significance of that to me as an Indigenous student. And uh, the picture in the middle here is from some of the other work that I've done as a research assistant at the University of Alberta. So I worked as a research assistant with Dr. Lana Wasijak on their um, Tapetemogamic uh, project that is a lodge for uh, Sea Spirit uh, youth and their families in Edmonton and we work on um, creating rites of passage and ceremonies that are inclusive for uh, those families. And that's a picture of one of the camping activities that we've done. Okay. So these are a bunch of pictures of me and Kaylee as sisters. Uh, We, Kaylee, do you want to talk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we've always been like super close. Um, we're only only four years apart. Um, and yeah, we've just always been like best friends, doing everything together. Um, I was actually called Mini Kira in middle school, so there's that. <laughs> um, and yeah, we've always uh, loved watching really any type of animation together, um, like just like those quirky, cool, kind of queer animations like Adventure Time. Um, Inuyasha was also one um, and Sailor Moon, just things like that. Um, and I also always loved not playing video games, but watching Kira play video games, um, just like kind of living vicariously through her like a movie. Um, so yeah. Yeah, we have a tradition uh, ever since we were really young of playing a lot of visual novels and mystery games together. So I remember us like sitting on the floor at our dad's house uh, by the PC that was on the floor uh, playing like big fish games, uh, like just like interpretations of Agatha Christie novels, but as like a 3D game, stuff like that. And still today, throughout the year, I save up all the mystery games that I see came out during the year, and I save them up for the holidays when we're together so that I have one for us to play. Um, and so in our art, I am the writer and the coder, and I've been writing stories forever while Kaylee's been uh, an artist forever within our lifetime. <laughs> And like when I was a kid, I would be carrying around all these like little flippy notebooks from the dollar store and all of them would be filled with different stories that I was writing at the time. Um, so I have like a stack of notebooks that all had different stories in progress. I don't think any of them were ever actually finished. Uh, but that was just something that I always did. Kayla? Um, yeah, pretty much same here, um, and except instead of the spiral notebooks, I would have like Dallas Store sketchbooks. Um, I was like that child sitting at recess, just like drawing all recess, doing like um, not commissions because I was like 10, but, you know, requests drawing people portraits at recess. <laughs> um, and yeah, just always drawing, always doodling in my notebooks. I have like boxes of my old sketchbooks just filled. Um, so yeah, I've just always loved drawing um, and never thought I'd be able to kind of make that into a career or like doing that officially. Um, and yet here I am. So that really worked out <laughs> and doing it with my sister. So this is our little journey of how we came to uh, be working on the projects that we're working on. So back in 2019, well, first of all, based on like the last slide, since we were both always working like me as uh, writing stories and Kaylee 
drawing things. We always talked about wanting to do something together. We wanted to like make comics or something, like how can we both bring our things together and make stories together? And it was not until 2019 that we like suddenly realized like we could try to make a game, um, like visual novels, like the ones that we play all the time. Uh, so in 2019, I was working at the Vancouver Queer Film Festival, and because of that, I got to go to the Imaginative Film Festival in Toronto looking for Indigenous queer films to bring into our program. And we then saw the Indigital space and met all the Indigenous game devs, and that is what inspired us to try our hand at this. Um, partly because we knew that there was a community there to support us in learning this, like people encouraging us and that there were people interested in, in what we would make, that there was like a, a platform to show it at. <clears throat> Kayla, you want to talk about 2020? Sure, yeah, big year. <laughs> um, so yeah, 2020 was, oh, yeah. in many ways, um, but 2020 was um, the first year that we had something in the festival. Um, so that was our first demo of um, our visual novel, Miquam. Um, which was, yeah, amazing. And we got to participate in Night of the Indigenous Devs, which we had attended the previous year as guests. And that was one of the extremely inspiring kind of events at Imaginative. And then, yeah, being able to like see our character Oasis on this poster for Night of the Indigenous Devs the very next year, crazy. Um, yeah, so, um, and it was virtual. Yeah, that wouldn't, uh, 2020 was virtual, but still really, really cool to see our first game in a festival, our first try. Yeah, and at the time, like I learned to start coding and making games through making this game that was at Imaginative. So it was a lot of like trial and error. And so one that was shown at the festival was kind of like, um, like Frankenstein, like I felt like if you like poked it, it would fall apart, but somehow it seemed to work. Uh, <laughs> and then in 2021, then we got to take part in uh, Dames Making Games uh, Damage Labs uh, studio startup and mentorship. So we learned a lot about just like business development and got support to learn how to start our own studio. Kaylee, you moved to Montreal. <laughs> um, yeah, that was the year I finished my undergrad um, for Indigenous Environmental Studies um, and found out that I was accepted to the Masters of Design program here at Concordia and moved to Montreal that year. Um, yeah, very exciting stuff. I feel like most of the stuff that year was kind of behind the scenes. <laughs> but at the end of 2021 was when the uh, HBO Warner Media Animated Shorts program submissions were opened. So that was when we started working on our pitch to Warner Media at the end of 2021. And kind of over the holidays was when we had our interviews and eventually found out that we had been accepted into that, uh, which I'll talk more about in a second. <laughs> so then in 2022, we had. So this picture under 2020, that's our first version of Make Womp. Under 2022 was, uh, you know, in the past two years, then we just like completely remade and revamped Make Womp in a new game engine. Um, we got a cousin of ours to make music for it. We added like animations. I learned how to code better in a new engine. Kaylee used all her new skills from Concordia to make new art for it. Uh, overall, like we just polished everything and got to sort of use the skills from the past few years to make something that was more polished than the Frankenstein we had in, in 2020. Um, and then that won the new artist in Digital and Interactive Award at Imaginative when we showed it there. And throughout 2022, we were working with Warner Media and Crooked City Studios on an animated short that you can now find on HBO Max and Crave. And so in 2023, we have pictures from our premiere in LA. And Sarah, do you want to say anything else? <laughs> um, yeah, so 
that was super exciting. We got to attend um, the premiere and first screening of our short um, back in March in LA. Um, and then since then, uh, we've been able to do a couple panels and screenings of the short. Um, so that picture is from most recently, um, I think two weeks ago um, from Imaginative, we got to do a panel on indigenous storytelling and animation, I think it was called, um, with uh, the other um, Canadian team, which was, yeah, really great. So yeah, 2023, I think at least these past few months has been mostly like uh, festival stuff for Kimo Twin. I think, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. This is just a little preview of like some of the process that we went through for creating Kimotuin. Um, just specifically around like this is what some of the process looks when we were making the character of Tiska for our animated short. So Kaylee, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but the very first picture here was a character that you had made in another program with Imaginative, right? Um, yeah, it was the um, seventh gen character design, um, which was, yeah, actually a skins workshop um, and uh, in partnership with Imaginative, I believe, um, creating, uh, yeah, like uh, 3D avatars of our characters that we created in Second Life. Um, so. I think of this little avatar as like Tiska's kind of first iteration, her first design, she's totally Spangs. And then we really liked her overall look and kind of just decided to build on it a little bit for this thief character that we were thinking of for the animation. And yeah, she just kind of became what she is on the right over there. Yeah, so like every like background character, every random thing, we had these mood boards where we could just pull in a bunch of pictures. Uh, and you can actually, I never forgot about this. This was originally called Thief Girl for like six months. Uh, we didn't have a name for her, so her name was Thief Girl. And yeah, along with a bunch of pictures of like Edmonton and environmental pictures and things that all came together into building a world for this short. Ooh, that picture on the right is a bit fuzzy. I mean, left. Uh, so just a quick look at the project we already talked about. Uh, Nick Wan, again, I have a picture of like the first version here and you can kind of see how the art developed. Uh, and so something a bit more polished uh, in the top right, even like the UI, that was a lot of work. And us winning the award for it. I guess I could say more about Miquam because it's a, a visual novel where you play as a apprentice to a healer who works with plants. And so in these pictures here, you can pick the jars on the right and make a tea to serve to the characters. And that tea that you serve influences the mood that they're in, which is represented by these element symbols and that influences the character's storyline uh, throughout the game. And we uh, last showed what we had in 2022 and it's sort of, we want to continue the story. We love the world that we built for it, <clears throat> uh, but it's on hold right now because we're both trying to finish our master's uh, thesis of Desai. And, uh, we spend a lot of our time on these projects over the last few years and not on our master's degree. So they're kind of on a hold now. Yeah, you want to talk about this? Um, sure, yeah. There is another picture of us at um, the premiere of our short. And these are some shots, um, some screenshots of the short, which you can watch on Crave. Um, um, yeah, uh, I guess I can talk about this big drone in the picture, um, which, yeah, we were inspired by a lot of like kind of sci-fi and post-apocalyptic um, imagery. Um, so it takes place in a post-apocalyptic future world. Um, is it the same universe as Miquam? Did we decide that? 
Uh, for the purposes of like HBO's copyright, it is not. <laughs> yes, originally it was, but <laughs> in our pitch. Um, and yeah, you can see on the left, there are the main characters, Tiska and her partner, Nisa. Um, and Tiska's whole kind of driving force in the short is um, her love for her partner, Nisa, and kind of just this effort she's going to, to get um, a gift for her to kind of pay her back for a gift that she got. Um, so yeah, she goes on this perilous journey to get this flower, um, fighting these kind of demons that are very inspired um, by uh, oil imagery. Um, so yeah, she has to go to great lengths to fight these demons, defeat a factory and get this uh, flower for her love. Um, and yeah, it was really kind of important for us to show this like really loving and sweet um, queer indigenous relationship. That was one of our like big moments was deciding what Tiska's driving force would be. And yeah, it was really great. It's kind of this on one level, it's an individual like love story and it's being driven by their love for each other. And then it's within this like larger world where we're showing how these relationships exist in a world that's influenced by colonialism and ecological damage uh, and and spiritual relationships and that sort of like frames the individual love story between them and uh, that is all so what we're currently working on is our master's degree and uh, promoting and doing festival stuff for uh, Kimotin since it just came out um, this year. And that is all. I put some of our links on this slide, so thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I loved seeing kind of the progression of like when you guys were kind of first starting and where to see it now, especially between from 2019 to like today, it's kind of seeing that progression was really amazing. And I can't wait to see more, especially once you guys are finished your little, um, once the master's work is going through, can't wait to see more, so. Uh, yeah, so thank you both for those uh, great presentations. Um, it's been really inspiring to see how you guys were both able to take these stories that either you grew up with or stories that you've always wanted to see um, and kind of transform them into these beautiful um, interactive games. So now we're going to switch over to the discussion period of this event. Uh, so I prepared some questions and I'm actually going to kind of blend my questions along with some audience questions uh, together. So audience members, uh, I have received some questions already. So if you still have questions, feel free to type them into the chat. Uh, but my first question to kind of keep it easy is, um, so the whole this event is both of you guys are, both teams are a pair of sisters. And I, I just wanted to know how did it come about that you partnered up uh, together. So what is what did that look like kind of uh, when you guys were little versus now that, you know, you're older and we're entering a more professional setting. So how is that? How did that come about? And like, how is that dynamic? Um, I think for me and my sister, it came very naturally because we've always worked together. When we were younger, we used to work in our family's garden. And we also used to watch each other, mainly my older sister, play video games. And we were really obsessed with that for a long time. And yeah, as we got older, she was definitely like the artist in our family and everyone really, really encouraged her. And I was like, that's not my thing. And then as soon as the pandemic hit, I was like, I should, I should probably teach myself how to do something. And so I taught myself how to draw and like very naturally, she was like, so I have some work. Do you want to help me? And I was like, absolutely, I do. Yeah. <laughs> So that's pretty much our evolution with that. Um, 
we kind of spoke to how it started um, with those baby pictures. <laughs> um, and yeah, but I guess like for me, Kira was one of my like biggest supporters with my art and like was one of the biggest forces, I think, like getting me to take myself seriously and take my art seriously and like um, kind of push me to take that to a professional level, um, especially once we started working together. It was kind of like that big jump into, yeah, doing that professionally. Um, and yeah, a lot of our projects we did um, remotely, um, especially like during 2020 and onward. Um, Kira is in Alberta and I'm in Montreal. So yeah, like all of our product projects pretty much we did um, virtually over, you know, FaceTime calls and me sending her a thousand screenshots and her saying slightly to the left, move this down a little bit more because she's really good at composition. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it pretty much came natural. <laughs> Awesome. And uh, another question, I guess, for you guys is, uh, so you, yeah, you two partnered up. And so when creating this, what were some of the, both of you kind of created your two studios, kind of homegrown. And so I just wanted to know, like, what was your biggest obstacle that you faced when creating your studios and companies? Uh, was there anything that uh, kind of was unexpected or was it like unexpected things that were easy that were unexpected or like things that were actually quite difficult? Um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear what you guys have to say about that too. I definitely know what the most challenging part for me was. Um, like I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. So I kind of for a little while in the beginning let my, I don't know, compulsive need to have things happen in the right order get the better of me because I was convinced there's like a right way to start a business or like I have to do ABC before the next thing and not out of order or it's not going to work so I realized thanks to my family and my friends um and some reading I did honestly like that there's no wrong point to start from um and just like to start where I had to start where I felt confident which was the art and making the video games just to be like oh my god yes this is something I can really do and you know bringing my sister into the fold really helped a lot because like we're so on the same page sometimes I feel like we're I don't know outnumbering Fred who's our third team member because we're understanding like my sister and I are like this where we're like thinking the same thing and we're completely on the same page and Fred we're very close with Fred, but he's like, he's not my sibling, you know, he's not my sister. So like, yeah, I don't know. I hope that made sense <laughs> for my answer. For me, I would say my biggest struggle has been like waiting because I'm a very impatient person. And as I'm sure you all know, the grant process is extremely, extremely slow. <laughs> So basically just waiting to hear back and then also waiting to hear back from communities who are overwhelmed as it is with like their own projects. It's been a lot of like just a waiting game to hear back about the projects that we want to work on. So patience is not a virtue I possess. <laughs> yeah, there's like two halves to our business. There's like the commission half where certain communities approach us to be like, oh, can you make us a language game based on these materials? So that's one half. And then we're, you know, usually in a state of being in conversation, like getting contracts sorted out or like confirming like, yes, we want a video game from you. And that can take anywhere from like a month to a year, depending on what the community is going through. And you don't want to push too hard, right? To be like, we want to make you this video game right now. <laughs> so I don't know. It's kind of inconsistent in that respect. And then on the other half of things for our in-house projects, it's waiting on the grants. So it's just a lot of waiting, which is quite difficult when you wanna have, you know, ideally a steady flow of creativity and work, but in reality, that's not always the case. Uh, I think 
I got like two things, but they're kind of like the same thing. I think the hardest thing for me is all of the extra stuff that you need to know how to do. Like you mentioned grants, like all the admin. I hate answering email. Um, like learning how to do budget and emails again. <laughs> uh, all of the like admin stuff that you have to take care of, even like when making the game, I also had to learn how to do a little bit of like audio editing um, in order to like splice things together that weren't quite matching up. And I don't like having to ask someone else to do it uh, or doing image editing while Kaylee's like doing all these things. But I'm like, I have to like resize a little, a little, yeah, a little. So I start learning all of these extra skills and the admin stuff. And then like connected to that is just having also a, for lack of a better word, like a day job, but it's also like, it's just like a lot of jobs. Um, most of my task managers are all uh, split between like creative projects and academic projects. And so I feel like I'm always going back and forth between like teaching, research, uh, grants, writing, creative projects. And sometimes you like drop a ball or two uh, when you're trying to juggle them all at once. And so like learning balance, I haven't figured that out yet. Fine. Um, yeah, I'll echo that <laughs> admin stuff. Um, and yeah, I guess burnout uh, was a struggle, um, which is kind of on that same vein. Um, yeah, just like you, especially Kira, but both of us <laughs> struggle is like saying no to cool things because, you know, you just want to do all the cool things. Um, and yeah, just struggling with keeping that balance, like you said, of academic and work and personal projects. And like, I really struggled with having time still to do um, like personal artistic projects. Um, so I'm doing 100% of my time to like our our projects as a studio and then you know school and work and then so I would have no capacity for like personal art projects which um, is ironic because those give me like more energy and like you know more spoons um, and so it kind of backfires on you a little bit <laughs> so always a struggle to find that balance yeah and I guess that also just leads me into uh, the next question, which is actually an audience question. Um, so this audience member says Tanzi. So digital animation um, and game design have so many details um, and aspects that can take months. So how do you guys deal with these long-term projects that can span uh, years or sometimes months? And uh, how do you deal with, yeah, kind of what you were mentioning before about like the burnout, like how do you guys deal with that? What is the workflow for these long-term projects as well? Um, I can start off. Um, I love Google Sheets, <laughs> basically. So I'll have like a, that's my main task manager. So we'll break down every project of like, okay, how many backgrounds do we need? How many characters do we need? Do the characters need poses? Do they need different facial expressions? Are there different times of day? Does the background have to have daytime, nighttime? And then the tasks will be assigned to either one of Gerugu or myself or Fred. Um, yeah, but like in terms of staying motivated for over long-term, like really long projects, um, ironically, it's, you know, not spending all of your time working on your project because when I was kind of in the thick of making Garihunya Nitsura back in 2019, I was also working at Abtech doing skins workshops and stuff. I was like still studying at school. So I was doing a lot of different things and discovering, you know, just how much work goes into making a video game while already having my hands full with all my academic stuff. Um, so that year really kicked me in the butt and kind of made me really burnt out on top of how burnt out I already was at the end of my bachelor's degree. Um, and, you know, time went on and then I discovered, you know, once things had kind of settled down, when I started actually playing video games again, I was like, oh crap, 
I feel inspired. I like love doing this. I remember why I wanted to do this in the first place. Because sometimes when you're like in the thick of a project and all you can see are the things you still have to do, you're kind of like, why did I think I could do this? Oh my God. And you're really going through it. But, you know, when you settle down a bit and you find time to like play video games or watch the movies you liked, like the things that inspired you in the first place, it's all going to make sense again. So yeah, don't spend a hundred percent of your time on your, on your work. You know, you need to get that motivation. It's just as important, like rest, motivate, work and other stuff. And that's, that's my response for that. Yes, rest is very important. I also had to learn that the hard way lace recently. Um, yeah. Do anyone else have anything to add? Okay, yeah. I'll let you guys go for it. Uh, I think part of how I deal with the yeah long term project is maybe it's not the best, but having a lot of projects. <laughs> uh, because you can take a break from one project by working on another project. Uh, and we've been taking a break from Nikon for a while. And then just this morning, I suddenly like started messaging Kaylee all these ideas that I had for Nikon, um for the first time in a few months. So having the breaks like from that project while we're working on some other things, and then all of a sudden like, because then you work on something for like a really like when because I get into like 4 a.m. Like when we were working on Miquam, I have pictures of me like working up until like 8 a.m. Like overnight um, just to hit deadlines. And then you get like really sick of it because you work on it for like, you know, 12 hours a day for like a month. And then you're like, I can't even look at it. And same with our animated short, like after all of the intensity of getting it done, I felt like I can't even look at it because uh, you just get so sick of it. And then it takes even a few months to feel like, oh yeah, that was cool, that was cool. And then I like it again. Um, and you can actually look at it and feel proud of the work that you did after you get some distance. Or in the case of Nikon, like be excited about that story and world again. always exciting when I get a string of texts from Kira, like she's got ideas. <laughs> um, yeah, I would echo what Kanda Wex and Kira said, taking breaks, um, either to do nothing and just recharge, but also like consuming cool art, playing video games and just watching cool animations, like just like brings me back to life, I feel like. Um, yeah, like I think, both times that we took a little bit of a break from Miquam after our first demo, and then we revamped it after that little break because we had so many new ideas and I had new skills, new art skills. Um, you had new writing skills. Like we were just able to revisit it with like kind of a new perspective, new things to contribute to it and new ideas. And that really helped and like, yeah, really helped in polishing it in a lot of ways. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, we're talking kind of about your two companies and working at it. So one of my questions about kind of working in tech and STEAM in general is, uh, so like, what are the challenges that you guys have had to face um, in this industry? Because it is, uh, it is a pretty like tech bro dominated um and so I was just curious to hear what were your guys's um challenges in that uh if you guys even if you guys had challenges uh and this is also kind of jumping on with another audience uh question we kind of had a similar one but uh yeah is it challenging um to get support in this as well uh from maybe perhaps like other uh other people in STEAM or just in general? I can speak a little bit um, about that question. Uh, one of the things that I've learned since uh, committing myself to the studio full time is that, and this is like 
no shade at anybody, obviously, but uh, everyone and their grandma loves to invite me to talks about, you know, the things that I do, but like getting access to the funding to do the things that I talk about, it's difficult <laughs> and it takes a long time. And after a while, it's hard to stay motivated because like it almost feels like some of these invitations to university talks or like industry events, they're inviting me to tick a box, you know, like, oh, the indigenous woman in technology. And I'm like, I'm happy to come and speak about what I'm working on, but I don't have the funding right now to create the thing that I'm talking about. So yeah, that's a little bit, I don't know, frustrating, challenging, but hopefully good things are coming down the line soon. Yeah. Um, for myself, I know that I've definitely struggled with like undervaluing myself. I really have a hard time asking for the pay that I feel I deserve because it almost like feels bad or I'm worried that uh, our communities don't have the funding to like pay me the money that I obviously, you know, worked hard for. And so I struggle with asking for like the right pay. That's just something that I'm going through and I have to get over it. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> I'll just say you're not alone. I totally struggled in that too. I still do. <laughs> Kira is one of my main, you know, motivators being like, you know, ask for what, your worth, um, advocate for yourself. <laughs> it is really difficult. <laughs> uh, sorry, I forgot what I was gonna say. Uh, I kind of feel like I don't notice the tech bro stuff because actually one of my like favorite stories is that when I started my first year of undergrad, I went to the University of Toronto and I saw they had a game design club, like game making club, and I thought that was cool. So I went there and the like very first thing they did at this club was show a presentation where they said, if you're not uh, willing to like dedicate like every bit of your spare time to making games and you're willing for like playing games to be miserable now because you only look at them as like work like they made it so intense and I was like I didn't go back again uh I thought like I I mean I feel like as like native people I was like I don't know if I want to dedicate all of my energy and my whole life to video games um because at the time I was doing a lot of environmental activism and like marches and ins and stuff and I felt like that's what I want to dedicate my life to so it wasn't until like in our presentation um when we saw that crossover of going to Imaginative and seeing native game developers and seeing that it could be um meaningful and cultural and this like creative process and not something that's like this yeah tech bro miserable corporate thing um that that we were able to come back and think about game making as a possibility when it was like something that could be uh, self-directed, like something that we could be in control of um, and use for a creative expression. And because of that, we have kind of stayed in those spaces, like in feminist uh, game studio accelerators and like things for marginalized developers and. Like, it's not just because they're made for us, but also because, like, I don't, I want to be places that feel welcoming. I don't want to really force myself into places where we aren't being received because that doesn't feel like a good use of energy. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you, so, and um, when I go on, you guys mentioned that you work a lot with community um, and a lot in collaboration. Um, and at Cozy Studios, you guys also kind of work with kind of fantasy stories. And even if like, for example, Mikawam, that's necessarily like, uh, it's kind of like a new magic kind of situation, so not necessarily connected, but still really um, embedded in community as well. So I was just wondering what 
if any, um, what is the reception that you guys have received in your guys' own um, respective communities about the work that you're doing? Um, yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so for some of the games we were commissioned to make for a Mohawk immersion school over the last few years, we've heard from like the teachers who've heard from the children that they're excited to see themselves obviously represented in the games that we've made. Because as Wanagirago mentioned in her portion of the presentation, I know like she works really hard to try and do like to draw people that she's seen in community. Like this is what indigenous people look like today because something like both of us struggled with when we were kids, we would look at those books published by like the language and cultural center and everyone's wearing like the buckskin outfits and they have beautiful like tan skin and long black hair. And I look at myself like a pale brunette with green eyes and I'm like, am I not indigenous? Like, do I not belong to this community? Where am I in these stories, right? <laughs> So yeah, it just means a lot to, to hear from those, you know, the secondhand words from children to teachers that they're noticing basically, which, which feels nice. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the main reception that we've had from everyone we've spoken to is just excitement mainly because, you know, it is cool to work with the, the teachers in our community who are like on the ground educating our kids and like doing the Lord's work, so to speak. And yeah, it's really fun to be able to give them new materials to work with after a lot of the materials that we work with are mainly, I would say like from the eighties, you know, like colored pencil drawings from all these spiral bound books that we've all had in our house on a bookshelf, probably since the eighties. So it is exciting to <laughs> work with our communities and have good feedback. I feel like partly, well, a lot of our stories, like, yeah, we're not doing like a collaborative project, but the storylines and the world and the beliefs and things in there are all coming from the work that we do with community, like, like the projects that I talked about um, in the presentation, like my stuff working with Parks and Fire and working with uh, queer youth in the city and just like being involved in ceremony and things. And like all of those experiences come into the way that we create these stories and like the characters and people that we want to represent in those stories. Um, in terms of like feedback, partly I'm not good at like doing the like promotion stuff. So I'll just be doing all these other projects in community and I don't tell anybody about like the creative projects that we're doing but uh we I do like show people I show family and some of the best like more satisfying feedback to me is is showing family so our cookum really was impressed by the animation and by the game and was like really like heartfelt touched by the stories and she's like so happy and that's one of my when I get insecure about like, is this any good? That's the feedback that I go back to. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's always nice to see like when people have like great feedback and uh, even going to Imaginative, I saw your guys' animated short and being in the audience and feeling the audience reception as well uh, and kind of feeling that warmth that was in the room too. Uh, it was really nice and yeah, so I'm really happy that you guys are getting good feedback. It's amazing. Um, so I'm going to turn to an uh, audience question. Um, do you plan on remaining a two or three person studio or do you want to grow into something bigger? I think for us, for the foreseeable future, we are going to stay a smaller studio because as I mentioned previously, there's a bit of not an issue, but like the reality is the work is a bit inconsistent. And before we bring any anybody else into the fold, we want to be able to like properly support them, right? So like bring them into an environment where they can afford to pay their bills and all those kinds of things that come along with hiring employees. So yeah, for the next little while, while we're trying to 
find our stride. I don't know the expression. Um, we're yeah, we're gonna stay tiny for now, but we do have larger ambitions, you know, farther down the line. Yeah, I agree. It would be nice to just stay me and my sister. <laughs> Yeah, I don't like the idea of the pressure of getting bigger right now. Uh, but as we kind of have said, like our plan is to just stay with what we have right now while we're finishing our degrees. Um, but we're trying to like set a foundation of something that we continue into the future and that I hope can grow like uh, throughout our careers as artists and, you know, be something that's kind of like a this kind of dramatic, but a life's work uh, that can grow over time and not to rush it to make it bigger than we can handle at the moment. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, you guys are planning to stay a bit small so you can work on kind of building out your foundations. I was just wondering what was the, uh, how are you balancing kind of the work that you're doing for the company um, and also your guys' own personal projects? So I know uh, like Kaylee, um, you're completing your master's with your dress up game and Gehenda Walks, you have Black Fawn uh, still like brewing and I'm excited to see. So I just want to see, uh, yeah, how you guys are kind of balancing that work um, and kind of keeping both alive and steady at the same time. Yeah, um, so that's actually one of the instances where the slow pace of like the grant writing process and like the slowness of solidifying, I don't know, commission works with particular communities is a benefit because while we're kind of in this waiting game, we have the time to work on personal projects. And yeah, the other half, I suppose the challenge for me anyway, is like, because we're a small studio, we end up wearing a lot of different hats and like doing a lot of the sort of admin stuff. Like I have to update our website here and there and I have to like monitor our social media and make sure I'm posting about the things that we're doing. So yeah, thankfully right now, anyway, we're in a period where we're kind of waiting for a lot of things. So balancing the personal projects, the behind the scenes revital software stuff and like solidifying commissions and grant writing Right now it's balanced, but you know, who knows if it'll stay that way for much longer. <laughs> yeah, I would say we're we're not lucky, but you know, motivated to work on our own personal projects at this time because we don't have the funding to do the big long year long projects we have coming up. So it's nothing but personal projects at this time. And it's it's still very fulfilling. It's still fun and it's enjoyable to like work on so many different things while you're waiting for the big project to come in. So I have a lot. I feel like I have a lot going on as it is. Yeah. So for now it's balanced, but uh, fingers crossed. And it also helps to make you more excited to work on the long-term projects, to have the time to do your personal stuff. Because when you're sick of looking at your personal projects, you can go back to doing company stuff. <laughs> I'm nothing but motivation right now. <laughs> Um, yeah, I like the it's balanced for now because yeah, that's so true. <laughs> Any a simple breeze could knock it over. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I guess personally, um, something I've struggled with a lot. I mentioned it a bit earlier is making time for those personal projects. Um, especially, I had like like a realization this summer about um, I guess making time for like hands-on things when you're a digital artist especially um that's something like I really loved doing um during my undergrad is I had more time I loved doing like um hands-on crafts like um embroidery and like working with clay um like actual paint like acrylic paint <laughs> um like I had so much more time to do um things like that and so yeah since starting my master's I've had a lot less time to do things like that and I've been like pretty much 95% digital work. Um, all of my craft supplies are like collecting dust. And I didn't really realize how much of a toll that takes on you, like just 
staring at screens all the time and not being able to like hold something you made in your hands feels so good. Um, so that was something I had to like kind of realize this summer and take more time out um, to do more of that. And it just felt like really, really good, <laughs> really fulfilling. And yeah, that just really helps. Um, ironically, it's like doing, it's kind of adding more stuff to your plate of that you're balancing, um, but it evens it out, it, it helps. <laughs> I'm so bad at saying no to things. I keep like, this has been uh, an ongoing problem that I never seem to figure out. So even like, I really have to finish my master's thesis. So I've been saying I can't do anything else. And then all of a sudden I'm like doing something else. I'm like, wait, I thought I said I wasn't gonna do something else. Um, and then I have to go back and be like, sorry, I actually didn't do that. Um, so there's like things that I just, like it doesn't occur to me to say no. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. Like whatever you want, I can do it. And then like a little while later, realize that I'm like stressing out over something else when I need to be writing and have to go back and say, sorry, I can't do that. And I have to tell myself like, I don't have to do that. <laughs> um, there's actually no real reason that I have to do that so I could just not do it and that's really it's really difficult I still can't really accept it um so I don't know <laughs> that's me attempting to learn how to do balance uh I also sorry I also find that when I get really busy I start like you said not doing like the things that help to recharge you like going to community gatherings and like things that I'm invited to. So when I actually go to like, uh, we have like high tanning camps and stuff. And so when I actually go to these uh, Cree classes and high tanning camps, I'll be stuck writer's block for like weeks and weeks and weeks. And then all of a sudden at like high tanning, I have like a line come into my head and then I like wander off and like write a whole article on my phone right there. So I just had to like, get away from the screen for a second and something will just like hit me in, the energy comes back to it. So that's another thing I'm learning. Thanks. Um, so I think we have time to squeeze in one more question. Um, so this is the final audience question. Uh, you kind of were talking about your inspiration, especially coming into high camp. So what is your guys' inspiration? Are you guys do you find that you're uh, jumping back into games and media? Is it going to high camp? as you were just mentioning before, um, or media that you find nostalgic, or are you drawn into what is new and coming out now? For me, it's a mix of both because I'm definitely one to dip my toes in nostalgia here and there. Like I love watching old sci-fi shows. Like um, I just finished, what is it? Stargate, the next generation? No, Stargate SG-1, yeah and then Star Trek, The Next Generation. So I love all of that. And then playing video games I loved as a kid, whenever I feel like I'm really stuck in a rut, it's like meeting old friends again, like, oh, they're still doing all the things I remember them doing. Uh, and then being really excited about new things that are coming out. Like I mentioned, I don't know, when we were in the room before the event started that I've been obsessed with playing Baldur's Gate the last few weeks, well, last, two months to be honest <laughs> but yeah that's that's what I'm doing these days to get excited about making video games <laughs> um for me I had to think about it but I realized very quickly that Studio Ghibli is that's the one you know I don't have to think very hard about all of my favorite like drawing inspiration and aesthetics and just like the color, the characters, everything about Studio Ghibli movies are just incredible. And I wish I could draw that good, but you know, that's definitely my inspiration and reason for getting up in the morning. So. I can't believe I forgot to mention Studio Ghibli when I was talking about <laughs> things we watched growing up. That was, yeah, 90% of what we watched. Um, yeah, I think I would also be a mix of both. Um, I love some nostalgia. That's like a huge part of my thesis with dress up games. I love nostalgia. Um, and I love revisiting 
things that I loved when I was younger. That's like, I don't know, something I've been discovering lately is like how much like life that gives me. Like it just brings me so much joy. I'm actually in the middle of an Adventure Time rewatch right now. Um, but then, yeah, at the same time, um, there's like so much to be excited about with new content coming out, like both with uh, video games and animation. Um, so be able to, I went to the uh, Ottawa Animation Festival in September and then also Imaginative recently. And I feel like those were like pretty big, like breaths of fresh air for me, being able to watch all these kind of new, um, mostly independent um, animations and games coming out was, yeah, super inspiring. So a bit of both. I feel like I don't consume media like thinking about inspiration, but then like I play, I've been playing too many video games. I got a Steam Deck this year and I've just been playing a lot of games. Uh, but it's like when I decide that I want to work on a project, then I have this like library of things in my head that I've been like looking at over the past, whatever, 10 years, <laughs> uh, that then I like, go back to, to to draw on us references so like in in some of the stuff we showed from our film bringing in uh old zelda games or whatever like all just like things that we think of and then bring in as as references to stuff and combine like games movies books too i brought books in as like inspiration for our storylines in in our game so just getting inspiration from everywhere and you're like combine them all together to make something new. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for uh, answering all these questions. Um, yeah. Thank you for the participants for attending this event. Also, thank you to um, Alex Ketchum for facilitating this talk uh, and having it part of the Disrupting Disruption series. Uh, so yeah, thank you to the panelists for sharing um, all of your work with us, all of your answers. Uh, this was a super interesting talk. Um, and yeah, so also thank you to the IFRC and to Aptech for co-organizing and co-sponsoring this event. Um, and also for those who are interested, the talk has also been recorded. Uh, so this will also be made available through the Just Feminist Media Lab. And of course, if you want to stay in touch with us or the panelists, you can find us all on Instagram. So Indigenous Features RC, uh, underscore Aptec underscore, Revitalsoft, and Studio Ecosi, all on Instagram. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for coming to this panel. I'll just hand it off to Alex for just any finishing up words. Thank you, Vanessa, for such amazing facilitation. Thank you again, everyone, for coming and to our amazing panelists. And thank you, Max, for captioning and Kit for helping with the tech. And uh, we hope we, we see you at future events. Thank you so much. This has been such an exciting evening.